Hello health champions. Today we're going to talk about the insulin resistance diet. What to eat and why. Coming right up. Hey, I'm Dr. Eckberg. I'm a holistic doctor and a former Olympic decathlete. And if you want to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss anything. So obviously when we're going to talk about the insulin resistance diet, we're going to talk about the diet that helps reverse insulin resistance, not the diet that helps promote it. Insulin resistance is reaching epidemic proportions. So more people than ever are looking for solutions, but there's so much conflicting information out there. People wonder, should I eat a low carb diet? Should I eat a low fat diet? Should I eat a high carb diet? Should I eat a high fat diet? Is saturated fat the cause of insulin resistance? A lot of people claim that. And by now, hundreds of thousands of people have had great results in reversing insulin resistance and losing weight and reversing diabetes with low carb, high fat diets and ketogenic diets and intermittent fasting. But at the same time, there's a large number of videos where people claiming the same benefits from a plant based, low fat, high carb diet. A lot of you out there have seen examples of such seemingly conflicting information and a lot of you have asked for me to comment on it. So today we're going to take a look at a video and try to clear up some of the issues. He, he was living with type 2 diabetes for nine years, neglecting his diet, not really paying attention to it. He came to us, he basically said, hey, I need some help. And we showed him this approach. And over the course of six months, he dropped 30 pounds. He stopped using metformin, diabetes medication. How many of you guys use metformin? Yep. Okay. He stopped using metformin. He also stopped using a statin medication. He also stopped using blood pressure medication. Now he exercises, exercises six days per week, and he's a happy guy, as you can tell. That clip was from a video promoting a plant-based, very low-fat, high-carb diet. And VJ here got amazing results. But if you notice how he said he had been neglecting his diet, had type 2 diabetes for nine years, he had been neglecting his diet. So any time that you start eating real food instead of junk, you're going to get healthier. Right? So we talk about a lot of different variables, but the first thing to remember is if you go from eating junk to eating actual food, you will get healthier. Now in my office, we use kind of an opposite approach. We use a low carb, high fat diet, and we have results very, very similar to that. We have people get off their statins, their blood pressure medication, their metformin, their insulin, no matter how long they've been diabetics and how, no matter how long they've had metabolic syndrome, it goes away when you stop pushing in the wrong things in the body. But how is it possible that you can get similar results with seemingly opposite approaches? So in order to answer and clarify that dichotomy, we're going to try to answer three questions. First of all, are the approaches really that opposite or do they have some similarities? Secondly, we're going to ask, what are the results that we're getting? Are they actually getting the same results that we are? And thirdly, we're going to get in detail and understand the mechanisms by which you can get this kind of change so that you understand why one approach might work better than another or why both might work. So this is one of those videos you really want to look at it the whole way through and stick till the end because if you don't get all the components and you don't see how they all fit together, you're not going to get the full value. So the speaker in the video is a guy named Cyrus and he's the one who together with a partner of his, Bobby, they came up with this particular approach. And the reason was that he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when he was 22 years old. And then he followed what they told him was a low carb diet where he was eating 100 to 150 grams of carbs per day and he was taking his insulin but he didn't feel well. He felt like he had no energy and it, he didn't get better the way he wanted to. So he looked into different approaches and because of how he felt he was pretty desperate and he said I'm going to change totally. I'm going to go plant-based, high-carb, 
low fat. My carbohydrate intake went from about 100, maybe 150 grams per day, all the way up to 600 grams per day within the first month. So I started out using between 40 and 45 units per day. And over the course of, of the first month, it dropped all the way down to 25, 24, and hovered in that range. So here I am today, 15 years later from that initial diagnosis of 2002. Uh, I've reduced my insulin use by 40%. I eat more than 700 grams of carbohydrate on a daily basis. And my A1C values, which is a, a three month marker of blood glucose, uh, your average blood glucose, is between 5.6 and 6.0. So I'm genuinely happy for Cyrus that he has found a way that he feels works for him. And I have seen too many examples in too many different circumstances to say that there's only one way to make something work for you. But we do have to ask some questions though. And one of those is, he's getting pretty good results, but are they optimal? The results are going to be influenced by things such as age, activity, and level of degeneration. So he was very young and he did something about this at a very young age. He got it when he was 22 and now he is 15 years later at 37. That's still a very young age. That's much, much younger than most people who are talking about type 2 diabetes. And because he was still very young, he had a very low level of degeneration. Most of his metabolic pathways are still working really well. He never had a chance to develop a fatty liver or anything like that. Then he is very, very active. You can tell from the picture he we're going to show in a second that he is in very, very good shape. And he says, he gives several examples of how people exercise every day. And that's a great thing. Now, I don't think that you should have to exercise to control your insulin resistance. You need to exercise for other reasons. But if you're young and you're active, that's going to help tremendously in keeping these values in range. And if you are already in your 50s or 60s and you have degenerated, then they might be much harder to get the same results. So I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to discount anything, I'm just saying that we have to be aware of these variables. So the question then is, are these good values, the A1C, that's a three month average of blood glucose. And in the medical diabetes world, you're insulin resistant, you're heading toward diabetes if your A1C is over 5.7 or anything 5.6 or over, which would be 5.7. He had reported 5.6 to 6.0, which is actually pre-diabetic. And his partner, Bobby, said that he was currently at 5.9 and he had, his highest value had been 6.4. So that's great. They're not diabetic values, but they are pre-diabetic values, okay? And I think even for a type 1 diabetic who have to inject insulin to control blood sugar, if you cut your carbs, then you can keep that A1C at a much lower level and you can create much more stable blood sugar, which we'll talk a lot more about. So there are many, many reasons to keep the A1C low, but I want to show you a graph here. And as you see on that graph, the higher your A1C, the faster your brain shrinks. And the best level to keep your A1C is 4.4 to 5.2. So I believe the best range would be somewhere right around 5. Okay? You don't really want to get over 5.2 because now you're moving into insulin resistance and you're accelerating brain shrinkage. Now brain is going to shrink no matter what. It's inevitable with age that the brain shrinks. However, with high glucose and high A1C, it shrinks faster. And then he goes on to explain a lot of important things about insulin resistance, that it's not just about diabetes, whether it's type 1 or type 2, but it's the driving factor in all degenerative disease. So high blood pressure and metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease and stroke, insulin resistance is the driving factor in all those conditions. And I couldn't agree more. This is really important stuff to understand. And something that's really important to understand is that even though type 1 and type 2 diabetes are opposites in the sense that one is caused by the total lack of insulin while the other is caused by excess insulin, if they are mismanaged, 
if you just keep controlling the blood sugar in a type 1 with insulin, then you will still create insulin resistance and the end result in many, many cases is cardiovascular disease, which is the leading cause of death in diabetes. And especially in type 1 diabetes because it is more sensitive, it has to be managed more closely because you're completely dependent on injecting that insulin. And that's why it's so important to truly understand these underlying mechanisms so that whether it's type 1 or type 2 or prediabetes or whatever, that we understand how to manage it properly. But then we get to the big question. If insulin resistance is that big a deal, then what causes it? Insulin resistance is the underlying factor present across all forms of diabetes. But a lot of our doctors in the medical community doesn't understand this. They, they weren't trained properly to to get the knowledge and the tools. And as a result of that, a lot of us are given uh, improper information. Doctors are great people, they're not to blame. But the fact of the matter is, if you really understand what insulin resistance is, then you yourself can treat insulin resistance and reverse it. That's what we're looking for today. So just like you guys said, insulin resistance is caused by the storage of fat in tissues that are not designed to store fat. So I buy that definition that fat in the tissues makes that tissues resistant to insulin. That's what insulin resistance is. And he's primarily talking about liver and muscles. And when the liver and muscles are full of fat, then insulin doesn't work and the glucose gets stuck in the bloodstream resulting in even higher blood sugar. So I'm totally on board with that. But now we want to try to figure out how does the fat get into the cell? If the fat in the cell is the problem, how did it get there? And then we have energy depots. We have what's called a glycogen molecule where you store carbohydrate or glucose. And then you have a lipid depot or a lipid droplet where you store fatty acids. So in this cell, we're operating in a person who has insulin resistance, who's developed insulin resistance through their diet. So what happens is that they're eating a low carbohydrate diet which is a high fat, high protein diet. And as a result of that, fatty acids march their way into the cell. So you guys all got here because you were present in the bloodstream to begin with, and then you just marched your way right into the cell. So up to this point, I agreed with him about 99% of everything he said in the video. But when he said that the fat in the cell is caused by a low carb, high fat diet, that it's because you eat fat, that you get fat in the blood and that fat goes into the cell, then he is actually plain wrong. He's ignoring hormone mechanisms. He's ignoring physiological principles, right? So let's look at this a little bit more in detail. He says that the cell is overstuffed, that it has too much fat in it because you ate too much fat. But the truth of the matter is that Anything that you eat in excess gets converted to fat. It's not the fat excess, it's the excess period because that's what the body has to do. That's the mechanism of storing the excess from a feast and saving it for a famine. That's just what the body does. So we want to think of it as excess anything leads to storage. That's the survival mechanism. And it's insulin that does that. Insulin is a good thing. It helps us create fat for future use. And if you open up any physiology textbook, you can read that insulin is a fat storing hormone, that insulin promotes the conversion of glucose to fat, and it prevents the conversion from fat to glucose. It promotes lipogenesis and it prevents lipolysis, lipolysis. So this is as basic as it gets. This is not disputable. This is not negotiable. It's the way it is. Any excess will create an insulin response and if we continuously create excess because insulin stores things away, and as long as there's plenty of food, we're going to eat more, then we have the opportunity to overload. And we want to think of this as overloading, as clogging the cell, as congesting the cell. Uh, and one more factor is frequent meals. 
This results in a bloated, overloaded, clogged cell. This cell is insulin resistant. It has a lot of fat in it. It has a lot of saturated fat in it. So here's where they go wrong. There's thousands of research papers that say we observed this cell, it was full of saturated fats, and this cell was insulin resistant. It resisted the action of insulin. It blocked the entry of glucose. They're absolutely right. There's thousands of papers saying that, but there's no paper that says the fat ended up there. We have proven the that the mechanism by which the fat ended up in that cell was that the person ate saturated fat and that's the same saturated fat that's in that cell. There is no paper that says that. It's an assumption. It's a correlation. So think about it this way. This cell is going to have mostly saturated fat. It's going to have about 50% saturated fat and most of the rest of the fat is going to be monounsaturated. And this is the exact same proportions, or very, very close to beef fat, to pure beef tallow. Now, I can see where it's not too far-fetched to think that, well, if that fat in there has this component and beef tallow has the same component, then it must be because we ate the saturated fat from the beef. But that's kind of like saying, well, then the cow <laughs> must have eaten that fat as well, right? No. The cow ate the grass, which is pure carbohydrate. It converted that carbohydrate into fat because that is what mammals do. We store excess as saturated fat. That is the only long-term storage mechanism that we have. And because humans are mammals, we're going to store our excess fat as the same saturated and monounsaturated fat that a cow does. That's just the most efficient way of storing excess energy. The cow stores excess grass, we store excess anything. So then the next thing to understand is any mechanism, any way that we can reduce this, that we can undo the excess and the storage and the clogging, if we can reduce the inflow, if we can start burning off, if we can unload and unclog and decongest, it doesn't matter which way we do that, then we are going to create a cleaner cell, a thinner cell with less fat that is less insulin resistant because once it has a healthy flow of energy and it's burned through its stores, it's open to receiving more energy. So then the next question is, and the only remaining question is, how does that happen for you? Some people can do it with calorie restriction, but it usually doesn't work very long because they go hungry and eventually they start eating again. You can do it with low carb, high fat, because you get very satiated. So you start eating fewer meals and fewer calories, a smaller amount of food, and that works. Or if you reduce the fat extremely, now you have a less nutrient dense food like what they're promoting in this video. So either way that you eat less, you can create this benefit. The question is which one is going to work best for you and which one is going to be the most sustainable for you. On the very bottom, we have a curve which shows what happens to your blood glucose after you eat a low-fat, low-protein meal. So you see how your blood glucose rises and then comes right back down? Okay? That's what's called a normal glucose response or a normal glycemic response to a meal. Actually, that's about as far from a normal glycemic response as you can get. All right? Let me explain. So I've just copied that graph. What he has on the left side here, on the x-axis, is the excursion of blood glucose, the changes in blood glucose measured in millimoles. So they don't give you the absolute numbers, they just give you how much it changes. So they put the baseline at zero and they put all the different diets at the same starting point just so you could see how much they changed. 
So I don't know where they started, but I'm going to assume that they were somewhere around 100. Maybe they were 110, maybe they were 90, maybe they were 120. Then you would just have to add those numbers to, to get into that range, but it's all relatively the same. Now, millimoles of blood glucose, one millimole is 18 milligrams of blood sugar change. So if you look at the graph, he goes from zero and all the diets quickly increase by an amount of four millimoles. That means their blood glucose increases by 72 grams, right? And that's what he calls a normal glycemic response. So the red line here is a copy of what he is referencing, that in 90 minutes, your blood glucose increases by 72 points in milligrams. But then, as soon as it hit the peak, it starts going down. And within three hours, you're basically down to where you started. And this is the problem, that it keeps going down. Because this, these carbohydrates, because like he says in, in the graph, it's a very low amount of protein and a very low amount of fat. So this food is processed very quickly. It raises blood sugar and when it's reached the top, it just crashes. And when it starts going down, it keeps going down. And what he calls a normal glycemic response is ends up somewhere around three millimoles lower than where they started. This poor guy is going to be in the 50s, all right? Or if they started at 120, which would be close to diabetic, he's still going to be hypoglycemic, relatively speaking, because he is used to 120 and now he's going to be in the 70s. And this is a huge problem. This is an extreme form of reactive hypoglycemia, that you get an excess insulin response and then it drives the glucose down very quickly. And these people have to eat very, very frequently. So this was probably a fairly big meal if it's a smaller meal. And here they have to refuel after about three hours. So every three hours throughout, if they don't fill up again, then they're going to crash and burn in hour four. So what he's calling normal blood sugar responses is that it goes from the highest point to the lowest point. It changes over 120 milligrams per deciliter in just a few hours. Now that's the kind of blood sugar swings that results in unstable energy, in unstable mood, and in constant hunger. And I'm not necessarily saying that he, with his diet and lifestyle, is this bad off, but I'm saying that the statistics, the data that he's referencing, someone with these values would have that kind of response. If you simply increase the amount of protein in that meal, Okay, you go from five grams of protein to 40 grams of protein, look what happens. Your blood glucose response goes up. We didn't touch fat. We only added protein. If you add fat and you take away the protein, you get a similar response. What happens if you add fat and protein together? If you add fat and protein together, you get that response. Now I think it's fascinating how you can look at the same graph and interpret it so completely differently. So he says that because the low fat, low protein blood sugar goes down the fastest because it crashes, he's saying that the combination of high fat, high protein provides the highest blood sugar. They were all up at the same point, but the blood sugar didn't crash when you ate fat and protein, right? So first of all, I don't know what they fed these people on a high fat, high protein diet to get the blood sugar to rise by 72 points, all right? My blood sugar, I eat high fat, high protein, and my blood sugar might go up 10, 15, 20, maybe 25 points if I have a large meal, right? My, my line would be kind of just hovering right here in the middle. I, probably would just barely break the 100 point line. So again, they probably fed them high sugar, high protein, high fat to, to get this kind of response. But even so, what this creates 
is satiety and your blood sugar is stable. This is a good thing. Stable blood sugar is stable energy, stable mood. And if you hadn't fed them so much sugar, then you would have that stability at a much lower level. And then I kind of combined the other curves. So if you had both protein and fat, you end up with a blue line. If you had either protein or fat, then you ended up somewhere in the middle. So either one is provides satiety, both provide more satiety, more stability. So it, it's kind of like you have a fire. Do you want to fuel that fire with gasoline or do you want to put a log on the fire? If you put a gasoline on it, it creates a short burst of heat and energy and then it crashes. Whereas if you put a slow burning fuel on, you create long term stability. So what he calls the highest blood sugar is just the most stable blood sugar and all it means is that you're not going to need to eat as soon again. So let's just try to tie it together a little bit and compare these different diets and try to understand these variables. So the standard American diet is high in sugar, it's high in carbohydrate and it's high in fat, especially processed low quality fat. It's high in processed food overall it is very low in nutrients because the food processing destroys most of the live elements. It is a calorie dense diet and you eat frequently. It is high in inflammatory omega-6s and it is high in the most common allergens such as wheat and processed low fat dairy. This is like a long list of problems because if it's calorie dense, but it's still deficient in nutrients, it makes you eat frequently and this is why you overeat. And that's why you get all this junk. You get the congestion, but you're constantly undernourished. It's like the worst of all the components. Then we look at the diet that's promoted in this video, which is a plant-based diet, but it's very, very high quality food, all right? It is, it, it completely eliminates sugar and sugar is the primary cause of insulin resistance because sugar is 50% glucose, 50% fructose. Fructose can only be processed by the liver. It congests the liver. It does all these things to the liver and the standard diet has a lot of it. Their diet does away with processed sugar entirely. So that's like a huge, huge step forward already. It is high in carbs, but it's also high in water and fiber, which makes the absorption slower. It is extremely low in fat. It is pretty much zero processed food. It's all good quality whole foods. Because of that, it is nutrient dense. Whole food has nutrients but it is very low in calories, all right? It has a lot of fiber and water. It has a lot of bulk, so it's difficult to eat. Even if you eat a lot of meals throughout the day, you don't get all that many calories, not as many as you would get from a standard American diet, but you're still gonna have to eat frequently because you're not getting the log on the fire. You're not getting the satiety from just the carbs. So your blood sugar is going to go up and down. It's going to fluctuate a whole lot more and you're going to have to fill up more frequently. They've also eliminated all processed oils because they eliminate all oils, period. So they're going to eliminate the plant oils, the inflammatory omega-6s. And they also avoid most of the common allergens because they don't do any dairy or any bread or any pastries or any desserts or anything like that, any no processed foods. So the biggest thing that they've done, in, and in that sense they're not so different from a good quality low carb diet, is they've reduced all the junk from a standard diet. That's a huge step forward. But then if we contrast it to the low carb high fat, now these have in common that they're zero sugar basically. This one's high carb, but this is very low carb. This is low fat, this is very high fat. Those are the main differences. If you do it properly, 
If you learn to eat real food, which is what you want to do to get healthy in the long run. Now, I do agree with some of the critics that if you just eat junk fat, you can still reduce insulin resistant, but you're not providing the body healthy nutrients and your chances of being healthy decades down the road are not that great. So you want to reduce processed foods. That way you increase nutrients, you eat whole food. Now, here's the difference also. Because it's very calorie dense, you're eating tons of fat, you are eating a lot of density. The potential for clogging the cell is great, but it is so satisfying and you're not eating any carbs to drive your cravings, so you can reduce the frequency. It's very, very easy on a low carb, high fat diet to go down to two meals or even one meal a day. And you're reducing the omega sixes and you're reducing a lot of the allergens because you're not eating bread, you're not eating processed food and you're not eating low fat dairy. You're not eating non-fat dairy typically. So whether you have type one, type two, gestational diabetes, pre-diabetes, that's what happens. They, they push you towards this, you know, high fat, high protein diet and you become more and more insulin resistant. And that's because low carb diets work. They absolutely work, but they work in the short term. They're not effective long-term strategies. They're not effective long-term solutions because they actually increase your risk for chronic disease. But you can't see that in the short term because all you're focused on in the short term is that you get a better A1C value, you reduce your blood glucose variability, meaning you get less swings and you get a much more stable blood glucose, which is a good thing. You can reduce your total insulin use. You can reduce your, your LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, and you can lose a ton of weight. All right, so now I think he's really losing his footing a bit because he says that all these diabetics are being pushed into a low carb diet and it's a high fat, high protein diet that is causing insulin resistance. But then he turns around and says that, oh, low carb, high fat diets, they absolutely work. And he lists all these benefits and you can't have it both ways. All right. So he says that in the short term, A1C goes down, your blood glucose variability go down, and that's a good thing. He says that you can decrease your total insulin use and that your LDL cholesterol goes down, plus you can lose a bunch of weight. Now, th this is the inconsistency, okay? Insulin resistance is caused by insulin. It's caused by a high level of insulin not allowing the glucose entry because of the fat in the cells, all right? He's, he's got most of the model right. He's just totally stuck on the fact that it's the fat inside the cell that's causing the problem, but the fat in the cell is causing the blood sugar to go up, causing the insulin to go up and creating a vicious cycle. But if you can have a diet where you get these results, if you can lower your A1C, if you can lower your total insulin, you are reversing your insulin resistance. There is no way that you can lower your insulin need and become more insulin resistant at the same time that you lower your blood sugar. It is impossible. You can't have it both ways. Either low carb works and you get these benefits or low carb does not do what he says. Then the fat is not the cause of the insulin resistance because if you can eat a high fat diet and get these benefits, then high fat does not cause insulin resistance. Okay, it's completely inconsistent. But then he goes on and this is the main concern. This is why a lot of people asked me and they get the, these results, they're so happy, but there's always someone that has to throw out that scare tactic and say that, well, you don't know what happens in the long term. And here's what they mean by that. He says that short term, it works great, it's fantastic, but in the long term, you get the opposite. And he doesn't explain why you get the opposite. He just says 
that you get these benefits for a short term, but in the long term, you get higher A1C, you get more insulin resistance, you get more fatty liver, you get more weight gain, and on and on and on. And here's where they are stuck. They look at all these research papers and they see the fat inside the cell, they see the insulin resistance, and they have this idea that they can't give up that fat in the diet causes fat in the cell. If they could just get over that part and understand that the body creates the fat from any kind of excess, then they would see this clearly as well. If you enjoyed this video, make sure that you check out that one. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.